Hey everybody, it's Felix. Um, I uh, last week I made a commitment. I said that I will watch uh, some shows from NBC's primetime drama lineup in a super size me type affair where I will uh, watch these shows and do solo episodes about them. But uh, yeah, so I've done it. Uh, watch two episodes of uh, This Is Us, the first two episodes, and uh, yeah, dude, I've, I this is terrible. This is fucking awful. This is some of the worst shit I've ever watched. And you know, I, I went into this as like you know a bit of a free speech fundamentalist. I've defended a lot of like you know really p- problematic stuff. You know. I, I I think Mad TV should be back on. It should be more racist than when it was on originally. I've I've defended you know Brass Eye day to day the most you know edgy segments. Uh, all the video games where you tactically commit a school shooting, but this is probably gonna sort of make me sort of a PMRC mom. I mean, I actually think that they should take these shows away from uh, older Gen Xers and force them to play games like Soldier of Fortune 2 and Mortal Kombat. But, um, you know, we're staying true to our word. We're staying true to what we committed to. There is no fire without friction in life. So I am going to recap these first two episodes and let you know what we have in store for the future of this uh, quarantine born series this horrible thing I'm doing to myself at the behest of people with real jobs of people who are in physical danger I'm putting myself in mental danger for you I would say I'm almost or braver almost as brave or braver than Andrew from E1 who is a nurse I mean you decide you decide Um. okay so our first episode, it, it starts with uh, Milo Ventigliama, I, however you say that name, um, the guy who got fired for Breitbart for like you know, saying he wanted to make out with kids or something. He's He landed on his feet as an actor. So good for him. He looks great. He looks better than ever. So like, you know, I always believe in second chances unless it's for something like this, which is harming the world. Okay, so Milo uh, Ventigliano, we're just going to call him Jack. His character's name is Jack. The thing that Joe Biden says when his dusty synapses just, like, shoot little, little like, dying spark plug sparks at each other. Jack is naked, and his wife, Mandy Moore, uh, Rebecca, is wearing the worst pregnancy prosthetic I've ever seen in my life. She looks like she tried to smuggle a 100 year old snapping turtle under her skin. It's truly poorly done. Uh, he's naked. He's got a classic boner. You guys all know what it's like to have a boner when you see a woman in her bra. It's pretty nice. Have a nice set in those things. You're getting hard. Uh, and he's turning 36, which is the a, the age that everyone in Hollywood is stuck on forever. Uh, He's like, do a sexy dance for me. You know, it's my birthday. And she's like, I'm so pregnant. I'm disgusting. And anyway, he goes to try to eat her pussy and her water breaks. Um, This is proof that no Italians actually do eat pussy. The Sopranos was right. It's just a trick to make their uh, wives give birth so they can have a son that they uh, teach to comb their hair back so hard it causes their hairline to recede at age 28. Um, So... You know, they go to the hospital, uh, presumably get that baby taken care of. The three babies, she's having triplets. Then we cut to, there's a very overweight woman. She uh, has a bunch of post-it notes written on the bullshit in her refrigerator. Like there's a birthday cake. uh, There's a bunch of other shit. She's also turning 36. Um, I, you know... There is there was a quote at the beginning of the show about how people how many people share birthdays, but um, that's one way to look into it. That the, this is just like part of the inner mythology of this dumb show, and there's some really dumb mythology in it. We'll get to that later. But I believe it's probably like a demonic signal by the writers of this show to their god king Jeffrey Epstein. 
I never went to you know Hebrew school or anything, so I don't know that much about uh, numerology. I'm sorry. Uh, it's up to the listeners to figure this one out, what the significance of 36 is. But yeah, so she has a bunch of post-it notes all, all over her refrigerator. And they say stuff like, you know, don't eat this. Uh, I, she pulls back one that says, don't eat this. And it, uh, there's one beneath it that goes, are you serious? Are you serious, Kate? Um, and she shakes her head. And then she's like, you know what? I'm 36. It's time to lose this weight. So she starts like throwing all this shit in the trash. Um, you know, she's having like a real realization about her life. And we see this hot, stupid actor guy. And uh, he's with two absolute Instagram 10 out of 10 baddies. And they're like, we want to work your heart on. You know, we want to, however, you know, you know how they write like sex stuff on network TV. We want to see if that thing goes. They're talking about his dick. And he's like, I'm sad. I, he, he's just like, generally being the brooding like actor with a lot of money who's sad that he doesn't do good acting. He, uh, this is the only thing in the show I related to was the part after this, where they take him out to the pool party or in like Vegas or some shit. And he starts talking about how his life all started going to hell when he witnessed the challenger explosion when he was in like fourth grade. And this is a technique I've used to ward women off. Just talking about some tragedy that didn't really affect you, but just an excuse to talk about it. Um, it's it's kind of kind of swag. It sort of makes him the only likable character in this whole affair. That he is successfully um, warding off women and their awful advances by making an excuse. My favorite thing, the thing that gives life meaning: making excuse, making excuses. All right, so she he's on the phone. He gets a call that saves him from putting on a condom, taking a look at that bra, doing all that stuff we know about. Um, and guess what? It's Kate. It's the woman we saw in the last scene. What? That's his sister? And it's his birthday? Whoa, what the fuck? Uh oh, better better make a bookmark there. Uh oh, I hope you still have your scholastic bookmarks, readers. Hope you can remember that part because it's important. Okay, so uh, Jack and Rebecca cut back to them. They're at the hospital, and it's not their regular pussy doctor. It's this old guy. His name is Doctor K. And he goes, you can call me Dr. K to be folksy because everything in this show is written in soy core. Like this scene takes place in 1980 and this doctor looks like a fucking prospector that was forcibly bathed. But he's like, uh, yeah, so we're going to do the thing where you act like, you know, me, <laughs> I like I'm going to be a little folksy because everyone on this show, everyone who wrote for this show has had their brains so warped by only being in writer's rooms for like fucking two decades that they can only imagine people talking like them, even if it's like, uh, even if it's like a Korean War veteran who has looked at looked at broken pussies for forty years, he's still he's still talking like a guy who banter[s] with Chuck Wendig. Um, he's goes through his whole soy core spiel of like, oh, uh, yeah. So I've seen quite a lot in my day. I'm a doc- I'm seventy three. Uh, yeah, I've seen a lot. And then he like reassures Rebecca because she's freaking out. Like, I've never had a pussy, but I imagine, like, if you had one mechanic on it for however many months it takes to create the baby and a new one comes in, you'd be freaked out. But he he um, he he totally ameliorates the situation by being nice. Um, So he's he's working on the he's working on the undercarriage. Nothing to worry about there. So we cut to this. uh sort of, uh, I'd say like late 30s, like in shape, handsome black dude, finance guy, played by Sterling K. Brown. His name is Randall. And he's looking at his emails. And, you know, you've seen emails in network TV shows. They're like, um, great job on the business deal. Subject line, a million dollars. And then there's one that's like, uh, the camera pans down in a way where you can tell it's important. And that's right when everyone in his office 
um, at his nondescript finance job because he has his dual monitor set up. No RGB, no, no eager lighting, but he has a dual monitor set up to, you know, monitor currency trades. Um, they're like, happy birthday, Randall, because, yeah, it's his fucking birthday, too. Whoa. Um, while they're there and all the people who are unindicted co-conspirators of Jeffrey Epstein in his office are singing him the birthday song, uh, he looks at the email. It's a picture of an elderly black man. It's his dad. He didn't know his dad. Whoa, holy shit. All right. So... Sterling K. Brown Randall, he goes to uh, he goes to this um, like sort of row house, and he barges in, and whoa, it's it's his it's his dad, and he he say, he gives him this whole thing. He goes, "You left me at a firehouse when I was a newborn, you piece of shit!" Like he he points to his uh, bands outside, and he goes. See that car? It cost $100,000, and I bought it cash because I feel like it. Like, uh, okay. Just, uh, you know, this guy is presumably homeless for most of his life. Like, look, you know, no one has a good relationship with their dad, but you're also not winning any awards for playing, paying MSRP when you literally work in the most evil industry in the world. You can't just, like, uh, cut a deal with, some other guy who owns like a lesser pedophile island to give you like a car that fell off a truck in Germany. Uh, but yeah, it's like a extremely malformed version of everyone's favorite scene, everyone's favorite serious scene from Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You know, like why doesn't he want me, man? But done really shittily, done in you know 2016 or whenever this the show first started airing, where everything is like cut for time and like made with the idea that it will show up in gift form later, or it will be like uh, a video that someone posts on Twitter 10 years in the future where they go, who else, who, uh, who else felt like this scene snapped? Who else cried when this scene happened? You know, so uh, Ken Olin, the never Bernie executive producer piece of shit of this show can uh, buy like a heated footpath for his Tesla with all the extra residuals from it going viral, even 10 years after this awful show is out of storylines. But, you know, because this should, you know, what's the greatest part of fiction? It's parallels. We get a, another bad dad scene. It's the actor in his show. He's in this stupid show called the nanny or the Manny, where the thing is, he's a like hot guy who has a baby. I always say that you can tell the strength of a TV show by how well they do the fictional TV shows within the TV show. Think about it. The fictional TV shows in The Sopranos, amazing, hilarious. Like the Law & Order clone, they built an entire episode around it that was hysterical where Adriana thought like uh, uh, spouses could not testify against each other. Um, it shows the It shows the imagination of the writers and how deep the lore of the show is and how, how, how dedicated to world building, but in a compacted way, the writers are how much they're invested really. But when it's like, there's a lot of bad network TV, there's really only bad network TV, but this is not a show that would be on. This is a show that would be on in like 1987, but because like everyone who writes for the show is 78 years old and has been saying they're 36 since the Clinton administration, this is what we get. But he brings in uh, Alan Thick to play his dad, and they, yeah, well, what is, oh, his dad abandoned him in the show, and they have a big argument, and he, he really pushed for this scene because he thinks the show's stupid and beneath him, and he wants, like, real craft, and the audience loves it. They're like, good job, Alan Thick. Good job, guy who has the same birthday as everybody. You fucking balled out. All right. That was, yeah. You're like, damn, good things still can't happen in this world. Faith and humanity restored. Cut to the sister, Kate, sister of the actor. She's in a eating, eating disorder group. Um, and, 
you know, the people are going around like, oh, my husband is keeping me fat or like I, I have like uh, overeating issues from childhood. And there's just a woman who has bulimia. But it just like it just like played initially as a laugh. It's like she goes, the line is, I know that you that uh, what you people think of me. But do you know what it's like to look like me and have that seven extra pounds of uh, of body fat in the middle? And it's like, yeah, no, that's no one would ever fucking say that. I mean, like, I'm not begging for realism in my TV shows, but just some approximation of how anyone would ever sound just ever, ever at all. I, I don't think that it literally I mean, it, it, you know, what it is. It's like how. Whenever these people, these fucking screenwriter pieces of shit, write those dialogue tweets about like you know, something political happening where it's like me, I, I think women are great. Trump supporter. I want to rape every woman. Uh, Bernie supporter. I don't know. Joe Biden's bad. Where it's just like no one sounds like this or even thinks like this. And it's like, oh, yeah, you've had your brain warped and totally destroyed by the smog in Los Angeles County and baked by the fucking sun. You're completely alienated from any human interaction because every conversation, every little interaction you've had with somebody for the last 30 years of your life has been from like fucking ballet guys to your friends has been someone trying to get something like someone's trying to be noticed. Someone's trying to be discovered. Someone's trying to become the showrunner on uh, whoop, you know, whoops, I married my wife. You're all like, you just, everyone, you know, is a complete piece of shit. You would kill each other for uh, your first EP credit at age 60. You just, you cannot actually conceive of an actual person's desires or even just their most basic thoughts. So you get to write tweets like that that go viral and your show sounds like that now too. Um, so there like there's a guy in the group who's epic. He's like an epic fat guy. He and he like starts laughing during one of the people's stories and that's how we know he's epic. And he like immediately hits it off with Kate cuz like he's the only guy she's ever met who's epic. Keep in mind the real version of this character uh the character's name by the way is uh this character's name is Toby and uh if this character was actually true to form, he would be calling me the N word in CSGO. This is what this guy really is. But because it's a TV show, they're like, Whoa, he was epic to the fat sister. Wow. Um, around this point, I started getting the thought. I, I remember this thing that my sister, my sister is a uh, professor in writing. She's a PhD. She's written a, a, a beautiful book. She's the best writer I know, one of the smartest people, maybe the probably the smartest and funniest person I've ever known in my life. Something that she said about marriage story that I thought was incredible. She said about marriage story, I would tell I I, I would tell um Noah Baumbach sim something similar to what I tell my students. Is there any way that you could make the audience care about these characters? If it wasn't a millionaire Hollywood director and his beautiful, perfect millionaire actor wife, no, okay, rewrite it. That's what I, that's like, that's what's going on with this show. Like you have you have fucking you have Randall, and his only thing is that he's like a millionaire who has the the trauma of having a bad dad who left him at a firehouse when he was a kid. His, the only other things he does are like make him a lot of money and be nice to his daughters. Is there any way to make anyone care about that character if he's not a fucking millionaire? The sister, Kate, like her only thing is that she eats a lot. That 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 she that she has this problem with her weight. There's nothing else there. She's just like she's just this fucking void that you throw the other character's shitty lines into. There's like no there's just no actual anything here. It's it's just nothing. There's nothing there are multiple, at least like 80% of the characters, there's nothing there. And they, they have to think of like one thing to make you care about them. There's just, there's nothing. 
every side character in the Sopranos, every fucking, every, every, every grocery store clerk, every like fucking just associate you see who's killed in the same episode he's introduced has more characterization than anything here. The same is true of Justified. The same is true of, you know, any, yeah, probably Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy has way better characterization than this. But anyway, um, yeah, she, you know, what a surprise. The epic, the epic guy is going to go on a date with Kate. All right. Um, we cut back to the hospital and remember how Jack and Rebecca were having triplets. Well, Okay, the third one unfortunately died. And the doctor literally fucking, after he fucking tells Jack this, Dr. K, he fucking sits down and says, do you mind if I try to be profound with you? Like, first of all, if I, if I didn't know what was going on with my wife and one of my kids died in childbirth and a doctor gave me a fucking soy core line like that, I would, I would, I would fucking air hole his entire head. I think, like, I, for all I know, my wife is dead, and one of my kids died in fucking childbirth. It's the most horrifying moment of my life. And you're like, uh, yeah, so we're going to try to be doing this now. There is a little bit of a fail well. There was a 404 when your triplet was born. Uh, so, yeah, that happened. Um, as if your wife's pregnancy couldn't get any more dumpster fire. Uh, liter- uh, literally... Maybe Trump should build a wall around your wife's pussy. Um, okay, if anyone's got any cat gifts, we're going to need them. That would be the most shot doctor in human history. He would endure the most gunshot wounds ever. But to add insult to injury with this bad writing and bad characterization, the doctor who says this, I want to remind you, is 73 years old in the year 1980. He lived through the great influenza. It's 1980. Like, Jimmy Carter's... There's a chance he's still fucking president in this timeline. No one fucking talked like that then. No one. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. Like, this was... This entire show was designed specifically to accelerate, like, my natural predisposition towards internal organ cancers. It's probably accelerated by 30 years in my bladder while watching this show. But... So somehow Jack doesn't fucking murder the doctor while he's giving his like wizened but soy spiel. And uh, they're they're like, hey, um, by the way, someone left a baby at the hospital. Yeah, there's just a spare one. Keep that in mind, man. Make that bookmark again. Okay. Cut back to uh, the uh, Randall and his bad dad, the crack dad. Uh, He's dying. I think at this point, I literally just said, fuck you while watching up my screen. I just said, fuck you again. Like, you can't think of any actual interesting characterizations. You can't like make that dynamic. The, uh, I mean, admittedly very hack dynamic of abandoned son reconciles with abandoning father. Despite like the, one of the most overused like TV drama or even TV comedy plot lines. You're like, oh, yeah, he also has cancer. The doctor at the hospital has this, like, stupid phrase about lemons. Then uh, Kate, we cut back to Kate and uh, Kevin talking. She says the thing about lemons. Oh, is your brain started? Is your brain started ticking? Well, oh, it turns out that Jack and Rebecca, that part is taking place in the 1980s. Kevin and Kate are the two surviving kids who came out of the wife. The kid that was left at the fire station brought to the hospital. Oh, <gasps> it's Randall. Uh, right here. I wrote this show is the most insane thing I've ever seen. I'm fucking done, man. All right. Well, after this, I was committed to a second episode. I'm committed to every episode of this, or at least as long as quarantine goes. So we start the next episode. Aceveda from Oz, his name is Miguel, uh, is at the bar with Jack, and he's his best friend. We know this because Miguel says, I'm your best friend. He, um, they're, they're talking about Rebecca, and Jack brings up that kids 
at school call Randall Webster, right? Like as racist bullying. And then just out of nowhere, he says, you know, sometimes it's hard to see the woman I married, which I, I, I think like maybe there was a copy paste error in the script writing. Maybe there was an editing error, like just editing the actual episode because that line shouldn't follow the previous one. Unless like Mandy Moore, Rebecca is the one who came up with that line. She started bullying her own son by calling him Webster. Which, I don't know, that might add, like, an interesting... That might make her the most interesting character. My my beautiful racist wife, who's mean to the son that she agreed to adopt with me. Um, But, yeah, uh, Miguel says, You know what? Be grateful for your life. Your, wa- your wife rocks. Your, wa- your wife is so fucking poggers. You don't even know it, even though the scene takes place in 1980. Yeah, um... I'm thinking you're, uh, yeah, I'm thinking you kind of won the freaking wife lottery. Uh, okay, bye now. Everyone talks like Greg Proops for some reason. Uh, the uh, Kevin, the actor, he had a blow up at his show because they ended up cutting the uh, bad dad scene. And he has a fucking blow up at the, uh, in front of the live studio audience. And it's a viral video. Uh, he goes into his agency and they're like, Kevin, you suck dick at acting. Uh, you have to like be nice to the president of the studio so you don't get fired. We find out that Kevin makes $3 million a year and that he, his agents think he's totally talentless, which I mean, like he, I don't think the writers or anyone had the ability to show this, that, that, there's a lot of there's a lot of comedy to be mined out of like bad acting and bad actors, um, but because these shows are just like rushed out and NBC shows, NBC shows are like it's like having kids in the in midi in the medieval era. It's like you, you'd have to have like twelve because like eleven of them are just gonna fucking die right when they're born, or they're gonna get killed by a bear, or they're just gonna stub their toe, and that kills you in. 1411 for some reason every there are 500 fucking billion nbc shows made every week and they're all called they're all shit like this and you know one will go on to survive and in this case that's this is us which is like that's like the fucking charles the fifth carlos primero of nbc it's the great conqueror because it's 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 in it's fourth season right now it's a vicious tyrant we would never do anything cool like uh, Charles V did, which is try to kill Martin Luther. It will just slowly keep driving the mothers of America insane. Um. Anyway, so uh, we go back. You know, Kevin goes home, hang out with Kate, and Kate's like, "You just need to get epic with the." Uh, the pedophile that runs the network. Like you have to say, I'm not doing the, the Manny anymore because I'm too good of an actor. And he demands that Kate come with him because she gives him confidence. Um, and they love each other because they're brother and sister. Uh, and yeah, they're just, they're going to get, watch out for that party. They're going to get epic. Um, Jack and Rebecca have a fight when he comes home because he's an alcoholic. Um, nothing really there. This is another scene that has probably been, I've seen in like 500 fucking N- NBC dramas and sitcoms. Um, we go to Randall's house and Randall is literally running full speed on a treadmill at like 11 PM. This is, this is like the, the only thing they could think of for this character was genius perfect billionaire there's just nothing like oh oh it's time to do uh my equivalent of having a scotch i'm gonna run it's so this is also because no one who wrote the show has ever known a good person in their life or if they did couldn't recognize what made them a good person they're like oh you know what makes someone like morally upright they love cardio um all right uh, the idiot actor, Kevin, we cut back to him. He has a meet, he, he goes to the party 
and he he blows it by being stupid. Like he's just like, I want to act. And the the network president talks about how he wants to like own an island to fuck children. Not the second bar, but he literally talks about wanting to buy an island, which is you know it's it's sort of like uh, a vision board for the people that write this show. Not accusing anyone of anything. Parody, joke, joke, parody, parody, satire. Um, while he's doing that, Kate and Toby, like the Toby coaxes her to the dance floor where he keeps getting epic, and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the fucking epic dancing fat guy." And uh, Kate gets self conscious because she thinks people are laughing at her. But then uh, Kevin decides to get them really drunk. Um, okay. Nothing really to add there. Um, we go back to Randall. He's probably just suffering. He's the worst hangover of his life from doing too many pull-ups. His wife is afraid of letting him go to Zumba because of what a dark road that will lead him down. He will be sucking cock for HIIT instructions. It's a, it's a, it's a vicious path for Randall. Um, his wife, his, his wife suspects that their dad, uh, Randall's dad, who's moved into their house is using drugs and she has a confrontation with him, you know, a, a, after he gets home one day and she gives this whole thing about how Randall's so good. And she literally says his vice is goodness, which seems like it should have been like a note in the writer's room when describing this shitty character, but they just like the they just sort of whoops all buried it into the fucking script. Um, and she, you know, asks like, where do you go during the day? And he's like, Oh, well I have a cat that I'm taking care of at my old place. It's the only thing I have. And she's like, Oh, I was wrong. You're not doing drugs. And she says, I feel like a bitch. Randall walks in and starts laughing. And this is, this is one of those things that like I, I see and I'm like, ah, this kind of sucks. And, Probably literally 30 million people love this scene and uh, get malware using Bonzi Buddy to send each other emails of like camcorder recordings of the scene to all their nephews and nieces. Um, oh, also in this scene, we learned that the fail dad, he named his cat Clooney and he literally says it's one of those ironic names. Yeah, everyone, everyone in the fucking world is just like, some sort of fucking pudgy guy who went to Tish in 1996. Everyone is like you, man. Literally every, a, a fucking, a, a guy who fucking like abandoned his son 40 years ago and has uh, like overcome crack addiction. He's just like, he's just, he talks exactly like you. He talks exactly like every fucking guy who like went to a Kamala Harris fundraiser. He's Greg Proops. Everyone's Greg Proops. I wrote, uh, God, fuck you. Suck my dick, man, here. Okay, uh, we go back to the party, and Kate and Toby have this tender moment where he's, like, kind of being epic, but he's kind of being, like, I love you, and Kate's, like, well, he doesn't say I love you, but, like, who cares? But Kate goes, it's always going to be about the weight for me. That's the thing that's, like, keeping them from having sex is that she's, like, very self-conscious. And then Kevin pulls up, and uh, he's like, yeah, I fucked up my, my thing. I'm going to move to New York to become an actor. Okay. Um, we cut back to Jack and Rebecca. Jack is sleeping in the hallway and Rebecca comes out. He's like, why are you sleeping here? You know, Because this is after they had a fight. And he goes, I don't like being far away from you. I just yelled, shut up at my screen at this point. Um... Then he says, like, oh, I'm going to stop drinking cold turkey. And she goes, you can't do that. And he goes, I will. All right. So then there's just, like, the ending sequence of everyone, you know, past, present, and future, whatever, fucking around, like, you know, showing they love their kids and, like, eating cereal, but in a way that shows that they love their family. Oh, but we're at Sterling's house. Guess who shows up? It's age accelerated Mandy Moore, and it's Miguel, the best friend. Aceveda, you piece of shit. Mackie should have killed you. Fuck you. Oh, does this mean I, I, I'm sorry? I, sh I shouldn't call Miguel the character Miguel Aceveda, but that was 
The Shield's such a better show. I'm just going to be thinking about it. Aceveda cucked his best friend or Jack died at some point or some shit. I guess we'll find out. Wow, man, this really took a lot fucking out of me. And I'm just going to keep watching this shit. I, I, I really can't believe I fucking committed myself to this. Um, a few thoughts, a few thoughts in closing. So we've noticed that these are two, these are just two episodes, right? Just two episodes. And <laughs> the shit we have is my crackhead dad abandoned me at a firehouse and now he has cancer and we're reconciling. My wife is, is giving birth to triplets. One fucking died. Um, <laughs> it's just like all horrible shit. It's all horrible shit. That's like the common denominator I've noticed with like every network drama show or even like a lot of basic cable shows. It's just a constant barrage of fucking awful things happening to people. Just cartoonishly awful. Like, to the point where, like, if you watch it, uh, you've seen enough network TV or, like, basic cable, you'll laugh when a character says, I have cancer at stage four. Because it's just it's the writers running out of ideas. The only interesting thing they can think of is, like, five tragedies happening to, like, two people at once. It's their only idea. But I, if I can get a, if I can think of what the new world order, the Denver airport, John Hick and Looper, the Bilderberg group is, is doing here. All right. So we know law and order, right? Law and order. It's like an incredibly entertaining show. SVU even better. Every, everyone fucking loves Chris Maloney and Mariska Hargitay. Just wonderful, wonderful to watch. Very soothing. Like it's just like, you leave it on the background. It feels great, but you're like gripped a little bit. It's like fun, tight storylines, but it's sinister. Tens of millions of people watched it and it made them implicitly always, I mean, America's already conditioned this way, but it helped them like implicitly start trusting cops more, trusting police departments and federal law enforcement. And they're like, oh, we need to, yeah, we need to tap everyone's phones. We need to read everyone's shit. We need to, we need to like, just be able to kill whoever we need to detain somebody forever because you watch enough of this shit. You watch enough things where it's like, oh, literally every, every person is a pedophile serial killer or anyone will just murder for any fucking reason it makes you insane it just it alters your your level of expectation for the evil of the common man that you're like yes no every cop's chris maloney they're not just like a a hot dog necked idiot that will just like find the first fucking black guy or they're not like fucking jackbooted fucking ISIS agents who terrorize families and sexually abuse them. No, it's like this this handsome guy and this really pretty woman who are both like charming and morally upright. And you just before before you know it, you just you're just fully along for the ride. You would you would, you'll sign off on anything they do. You don't even you didn't even notice it happening to you. But what is, what what is if I was to read like the the Illuminati purpose into why their counterpart like the drama the family drama is like this why everything is just like you have cancer you oh you're you you were abandoned like just a barrage of tragedies and misery. Well, I mean, one thing you could think is yeah, the writers don't have any ideas. They can't make characters interesting at all to save their lives because they have no concept of what makes someone interesting or likable or even just compelling. Even someone you kind of hate, like what makes you, why do you think about them that much? They can't think of that. They're not talented enough. They're not interesting enough people themselves. They haven't lived that interesting of lives. It's just, it's just the only way they can write it. Or you can think the second thing, which is like, this is sort of this is sort of like you know how Victorians would just be upset uh, obsessed with like diseases that weren't real, or you know people before that would just think that they were constantly at risk for demonic possession or witchcraft, or you'd even think like uh, you know women in the in the fifties developing Munchausen's by proxy. They're just like in people who leave lead very comfortable sort of stayed boring lives that they, they have to imagine just horrifying terror and misery either out of boredom that they're not aware they're experiencing or out of this guilt. Like, Oh, I don't deserve this lifestyle. 
So I have to I have to think of the world as this more chaotic, evil place than it than it is in some ways because the world is a chaotic and brutal and evil place, but for systemic reasons. But people don't want to confront it in that way. They have to think of it as like all human evil is manifested as random crimes. It's manifested as like you know, like in Law and Order, just every everyone's a pedophile serial killer and. So all this comfort and wealth that I have, it's not that I'm undeserved. I'm just like one of the only people who isn't, you know, literally a demon. Or, you know, I am I am staying vigilant against evil. evil. This is my friction in life. This is my struggle. Making sure my children, who are like the most surveilled, like protected, comfortable fucking people statistically, like ever in humanity, making sure they don't get abducted. And that's that's the second way. And the third one, and this is this is my my crackhead idea I came up with. You know, we're recording this at five thirty a.m. Uh, it's it's the it's the it's that this is made by the Illuminati to beat people to, to keep people beaten down to make it so that even when they escape, even when they're watching fictional characters, they're like, oh, see, everyone everyone is also gets cancer all the time. Everyone else's life is like fucked up as fucked up into moralizing his mind but they rise above it because they love their family and it's guys like you know ken olin or just whatever fucking california democratic party super donor barnacle pieces of shit who are involved in these shows who are just looking down at normal people their fellow americans and going look you pieces of shit life's not fair well yeah, the li- the lives of the- these characters that I invented, they're not fair, they're tough. They have hardships too, but they don't they don't demand that the state, you know, pay their hospital bills. They get through it because they're brother and sister, or they're father and son, or their 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 wife and husband. Love will overcome everything. And it ju- it's it's a fucking Judy and Punch puppet show made by evil rich satanic pedophiles do in front of normal people to make them think that none of their problems are noteworthy and that they're, they're, they're in fact just B storylines. They're B stories. They're secondary to like the, you know, to the, the main plot and you can just get over it. Closing. I mean, you choose what you want to believe here. I'm more inclined to believe the second thing, but maybe there's a little bit of column, column three in this. No, Maybe there's a little something to like just horribly disconnected, shitty people trying to imagine what a normal person's life is like people who would balk at the idea of ever paying a 70% marginal tax rate on their unearned wealth. Who, who mask it by saying things like I'm actually Bernie's left. Um, it's them going come on, you pieces of shit. I don't know. Maybe there's something there too. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just like completely mentally ill from being on the road for six weeks and then being inside forever. Like everyone else is going to be now, but uh, I don't know. Maybe there's something from all three columns. I think that's the case as always. Like Matt and Trey said to close it out. I I wanted to compare what happens in the show, to the dialogue and the the dialogue is, it is potentially the worst part of the show. It's terrible because things that are like, like I alluded to, like things that are written as uh, like character notes, like, Oh, his only advice is goodness or just said out loud. It's just, you're just beaten over the fucking head. There is, there is, it is the most contempt you could have for your audience. It reminded me of something very specific and it's a very specific, like personal cringe. And the thing it reminded me of was, being 13 years old, being on AOL Instant Messenger, uh, <laughs> talking to a girl. And when we were talking about our parents, me saying, I don't want to become my father. <laughs> like, what did I think I, I meant? I mean, I had definitely seen it in a TV show. I had definitely seen like a cool adult who has sex saying it. I was like, "Oh, this is a thing you say to women to make to to make them think that you're you 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 fucking got something to you." 
You're like self-aware and you, you're very serious. You have gravity. Not knowing that it's like, that's guys talking. That's like already like shitty writing, but it's about guys who are having kids and don't want to like replicate things that their father did while raising them that they think, they think like scarred them in some way. Like what the fuck did I think that I, that sucks so much. I know I was 13, but I'm fucking beat red remembering this. It sucks so much. It sucks so fucking much. But that's what every line in this show is like. It's just like, oh, oh, here's something that I've like a serious person would say. Just drop it here. Just fucking put it wherever. Oh, and also the guy saying it, uh, we've decided that he has stage four cancer. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> the character here lost to get a childbirth and he's an alcoholic. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I mean, if you like this or you hated this, I did want to, I was remembering that while I was watching this and, and it sucks so much, but it, it, it's so fucking embarrassing and funny. I decided that it was something I had to give our audience that they could enjoy. Ever like, Everyone needs something to get them through these times, and I hope that you can <laughs> find 13-year-old me saying to a girl in eighth, it, when we were both in eighth grade, I don't want to become my father funny, and also evocative of the NBC show This Is Us. All right, that's it for, that's it for this week. I don't know how frequently I'll be doing these, at least once a week. We're going to add uh, to the rotation Council of Dads next week. I am... Fucking dreading it.